open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. And open in uh, chapter 20. Gospel of John chapter 20. And direct yourselves to verse 1. As I was trying to put this together in, um, in the reading of the text, uh, as, a, as we saw last week, we left our Savior, His body laid on the tomb because it was the, the evening of preparation for the Sabbath. Our Savior died on Friday. And the leaders so the people came to the authorities and asked for the people that had been crucified to be taken down because they will defile the land. And this Sabbath was extra special because it was also the Passover. So the authorities, Pilate, complied in order that their knees be broken. This is to accelerate the process of dying. Sometimes people that were crucified lasted and lingered days in agony on the cross. But we read that when the time came to break Jesus' knees, he was already dead. He had already expired instead of breaking his knees. According to scripture, that not of not one of his bones will be broken. This is John who says this, uh, quoting the Old Testament and identifying this prophecy with the fulfillment of what happens next. They did not break his knees; rather, they realized he was dead. And to confirm his death, they they used a spear to stab him on the side. Uh, they pierced him. And water and blood came out. I said that this indicates that he died of uh, uh, his wounds. Uh, that when he when he was um, uh, flogged, the the damage on his back affected his his lungs, and his lungs began to fill with fluid. So he died of uh, asphy asphyxiation. So we saw that Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus took the body to a nearby uh, garden where there was a brand new tomb no one had been laid on, and they placed his body there, his lifeless body. And we talked about how the hands that had cured many, the hands that created this universe, the hands that uh, healed many now lay lifeless on that tomb. But now we see that John is preparing to, to give his account of the resurrection. And uh, it is important. In fact, we saw uh, last, last time how John prefaces this part of his narrative with a statement that says, He who saw these things knows that they are true and his testimony is reliable. John says this because he wants to anticipate the reaction of the skeptic, the reaction of the reader. Remember, he's reading uh, at least some 30, 40 years after these events, so he's reflecting upon this and he knows it many of his readers uh, will not understand this in the context of the Old Testament. So he, he drops this footnote to explain the reader what is taking place and what is about to, what he is about to read. So today I decided to, uh, to concentrate on the subject of the resurrection. The reason being is because I think that Familiarity, uh, we are familiar with this topic, we are familiar with the subject of the resurrection. Uh, every Easter we, we hear, we talk about it. And, and I think as human nature is, we become familiar with it and then it, it, 
naturally we tend to to lose the interest we tend to uh to become a used to it and move on we are creatures of habit and sometimes familiarity shields us from grasping the importance of these things you know unfortunately this is the case this is the case of human nature we we uh, grow used to things and the problem is that they cease to amaze us it reminds me of the scene of this movie uh, where uh, I'm sure all of you have seen it where the chef um, which happened to be a rat but nobody knows creates a, a soup and the soup is a hit in this gourmet restaurant in Paris and everybody's ordering the soup because it's the new thing but they become a used to it. the next time uh, the scene is presented in the movie this is a new day and one of the customers said well we know the soup but what else is new you understand that is human nature right we 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 uh we want something always new and the, the old truth in the bible sometimes they cease to amaze us because we are pretty familiar with them but this is detrimental for us so i decided to spend a little time in the resurrection and, and see also in the the account of john is very interesting uh, I, I went and saw the the accounts of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and and they complement each other pretty good. Um, there are some things that John does not give us in his account of what happened that morning, that Sunday morning, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So I made an effort to combine. Uh, John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, uh, ending in verse 10. And what I did is um, something a little bit risky because it's difficult. Uh, I try to combine the accounts of uh, uh, Mark, Luke, and Matthew with these verses in John. So I'm going to read you the, the copulation. Uh, with the basic te text in John, that's what we're going to end up with. But uh, we're going to start with one part of the Gospel of John in chapter 20, verse 1. Just a little phrase from there. Then we read, we're going to be reading Mark. Then we're going to reading be reading uh, Matthew chapter 27. Then Luke chapter 24. And we're going to end up with... John chapter 20, verses 1 to 10. Right, so that you have an idea of what's happening. Uh, that's why this is not going to be in your in, in the page of chapter 20 or verse uh, John chapter 20. You're not going to find everything that I'm going to read because it's a combination. And probably you will hear some redundancies as well. But it's for reason that it is a combination of the text. To give, to give a little bit of more... A broader picture of what takes place the day of the resurrection and Sunday to us the first day of the week to them all right so I'm gonna read uh, the text combined uh, I'm gonna begin now this is what it says now the first day of the week when the Sabbath was passed Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James Joanna and Salome bought spices so that they may go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and he came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. 
And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember, he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise, and they remember his words. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with a linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who had reached, excuse me, then the other disciple who, who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we read these accounts from the Gospels, we pray, Lord, that you will work in our hearts, creating in us faith, repentance, perseverance, obedience, the fruit that you desire from us, Lord. As well, we, Father, we remember this morning the persecuted church. We pray for them this morning. And ask for your blessing and protection in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, the first thing is the plain in the text, the plain thing, and the most important. Having pleased his father by laying down his life, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead according to scripture. That is the great truth that is conveyed for us in the text. That Jesus, having fulfilled his mission, having accomplished everything that the Father commanded him to do, he rose from the dead. So what we're going to do today, we're going to deal with the implications of what it means. We're going to explore a little bit uh, some of the implications of the fact that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, rose from the dead. And this took place not in a faraway land, not in a fairy tale. This is not only the experience of one man who claims to have seen these things, but this account is found in one of the most reliable documents in history, one of the most attested documents, in fact, one of the most tested documents in history which also happen to be our New Testament that what we are reading are not just the saying of one guy who had a vision or something but rather we are reading the fulfillment of what is written in the Hebrew scriptures 
in what is known to us as the Old Testament. And this is taking place in time and space and real history. This really happened. It's not a legend. It's not fantasy. It is the account of something that took place in real time and space. And what we are reading is a fulfillment of what the law and the prophets spoke many hundreds, many thousand years before all these, th all these things took place. We are reading history. We are reading his story. Christ risen from the dead is one of the core doctrines of our faith. Christ crucified and risen from the dead in accordance with the Hebrew scriptures was the battle cry of the apostolic evangelism proclamation. Christ defeating death was one of the points of boasting of the apostle Paul. Now, this is this is core doctrine. The point I'm trying to make and the point that I will labor is this. That if this is not true, and this is just the invention of some crazy dude, we are wasting our time. In fact, we must abandon all hope. If the resurrection did not happen, if Christ did not come back from the dead, we are wasting our time here. In fact, I don't see any reason why to continue living on this earth, personally, if this is not true. This, this goes beyond preference. This goes beyond belief. This, the, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that I may believe this, but the fact that I believe it doesn't make it true. The point I'm making is true stands by itself independently whether we believe it or not. It doesn't affect it one bit. Some people say, well, if that helps you, if that floats you both, good for you. That would be good if truth were relative, if truth depended on us to exist. The problem is the truth stands by itself and it affects us whether we believe it on it or not. You may not believe in rain, but it'll rain. And if it rains, you will get wet when you go outside, whether you believe it or not. It will make your grass grow outside as well, whether you believe in mowing the, the lawn or not. You see, it'll affect you whether you believe on it or not, whether you accept it or not. It does have nothing to do with your preference. Truth stands all by itself. The Apostle Paul made the resurrection his battle cry. There were two dimensions to this. It was a crucified Christ that he preached and he enjoyed to proclaim him risen. He loved to proclaim to the Jews, Christ crucified. And he saw the contempt of the Greeks to this. We, we see in Mars Hill that when he mentioned the resurrection, that's when he lost his audience in, in, in Athens. That's where they stopped him and said, you know what, we will hear you on these things again. He tells to the, uh, to the Corinthian church that when he planned, when he strategized to come to Corinth to share the gospel with them, he said that he considered to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And that so that he can proclaim it risen from the dead. You understand that? This is core doctrine. In fact, talking to the Corinthian church in chapter 15, if you want to go there to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. 
Paul is challenging the teaching of some that had infiltrated the church. Where they were challenging the truth of the resurrection. It appears that they were denying the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And it appears that it, it appears that this uh, had spread up somewhat in in the church in Corinth. So there were some who were saying <clears throat> Jesus did not rise from the dead. And it appears they were saying that his spirit rise, but not his body. I, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. There is a lot of sex today that uh, are very large to teach this rubbish. So Paul says, Paul takes them on and takes their their false teaching to their logical conclusion, right? This is this shows to us uh, Paul's thinking, Paul's mind, very classic in this sense. Uh, he's using that method called reduction out of sorting. That means reducing your opponent's argument to their logical conclusion and render absurd, render, rendering it absurd. Nonsense. So in verse 12, the apostle says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? It's a simple question. Paul is saying, well, if, why, he's saying, why if what we preach is that Christ rose from the dead? This is the core doctrine this is what I gave to you. This is what Paul is saying. I taught you that Christ rose from the dead. And he asked the question, then why are some of you saying that there is no resurrection? It is a simple question. He's saying, well, if I taught you that Jesus rose from the dead, how come some of you are saying that he did not rise from the dead? Where do you get that from? That's pretty much what he's saying. The resurrection is core doctrine. How can you deny it? That's what Paul is saying. But not being satisfied with the question, he goes on and takes takes this to the, its logical conclusion. Listen to what it says in verse 13. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. You understand what he's saying? He's saying, friends, if Christ is not risen, we are wasting our time here. It's pointless. If Christ has not raised from the dead, we are wasting our time. There is no reason. There is no reason why to even have a church. There is no reason why you must believe. Why will you obey me? Why will you follow our teachings if Christ did not raise from the dead? Well, this is the implication. He's saying you're wasting your time. Because if, if there is no resurrection, that means Christ is dead. And if Christ is dead, everything else goes out the window. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, there is no reason for Christianity. It loses its importance and its meaning. You know, you remember when, when uh, a few a few weeks back, we asked the question. Why is it the why is the gospel still relevant today? Why is the gospel relevant today after 2000 years? Why is the gospel relevant? Why is it important to preach the gospel 
Why is it relevant for the guy who serves tacos in Houston and the dictator in China? And the answer was because we all die. This is why the gospel is still relevant today. Because we still haven't found the cure for death. We still haven't overcome death. And all of us must face death just a matter of time. We all have a death sentence. Period. But Paul is saying if Christ did not rise from the dead then the gospel is futility. The gospel has no importance. Then if this is true the prosperity preachers will be right and saying come to Jesus for whatever other reason than for life, than for salvation from the wrath of God. Right? Because they say come to Jesus, he'll give you the car, he'll give you the house, he'll give you the best life now. Because they have departed from the centrality of Jesus Christ and the centrality of the resurrection. That's what Paul is saying. If, if, if there is no resurrection, it's pointless. One of the core claims of Christianity is that, is that the dead will be raised from the dead. One of the core teachings of Christianity is that we, that when we die, we shall rise again. There are loved ones who die in Christ. Will rise again. They will raise in body and soul. And Jesus is the first of many. Having by his, having by his righteousness. Satisfied the demands of God. And by his death paid the price for sins committed. Now all who are linked to him by faith will also be raised to eternal life and glory, all on the strength of Jesus' death and resurrection. You know what this means? It means this, that it is because Jesus rose from the dead and that we, by being united to him by faith, will also rise from the dead. This is what it means. This is why the resurrection is so important. Because it is in the strength of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead that the promise is given to us. It's very simple. Look, Jesus rose from the dead. And because you believe in him, you will also rise from the dead. That's the simple implication. So in verse 15, the apostle say, says, We are even found to be misrepresenting God. He says, We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not rise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. You understand what, what this is saying? Paul is saying, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we, we are not only hopeless, but we are also liars and heretics. Because we find ourselves telling lies about God. If God did not rise Christ from the dead. If the dead does not rise, Paul is saying. We're not only hopeless, we are also liars. That's what Paul is saying. If Jesus did not rise. We're not only hopeless. But we are also lying about God. We are also blaspheming as the Jews accuse us. 
if Christ did not rise from the dead. Then verse 16, the apostle says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all of all people most to be pitied. saying if your christianity is only good to make you have good morals and it's only good to give you some sense of order and some comfort in this life and that's all it does if your christianity doesn't affect your eternal destiny If Christ does not affect your eternity, he says, we of all people are to be pitied. Meaning, we are the worst of everything. If Christ did not rise from the dead. You understand the importance of this? So what we're reading in John as much as familiar we are with the fact that Jesus rise from the dead raised from the dead it is the most wonderful news that we can hear because you see the the direct implication is this Jesus rose from the dead. And I believe in Jesus. And if he rose from the dead, that means that I will also rise from the dead. That also means that all that he says, all that he said is true. And that my eternal destiny in Christ Jesus is secure. And this is why in verse 53, brother, in this chapter, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, the apostle declares the triumph of the fact that Jesus is risen. Listen to what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, uh, and on forward says, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. All death, where is your victory? All death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You understand what this is saying? This means, that, listen, what the apostle is saying is this. If there are no sins to be charged to our account, then why should we be, why should we be held by death? You understand that? So it, the implication is very simple. This is what Paul is saying. If through Christ, if through Christ our sins are forgiven. So if we have no charge of sins against us because Christ paid the price. Why would death hold us back? You understand that? Because the power of death is sin. Meaning, if you die in your sins, if you die in your sins, it's like when you are a criminal and an outlaw at large and you are caught by the law. You are caught by the law, you will be judged by the law, and you will be processed 
and executed by the law because you're guilty. But if you're innocent, if your sins have been removed by Christ, by you believing in Christ, your sins have been removed as far as the east from the west, then there is no reason why death should hold you. That's the implication of Paul. That if you are in Christ, this body, which is the perishable, that's what it means, this perishable body will be transformed into your glorified body, that is the imperishable. That's the implication of the apostle. The death has been swallowed up in victory, and death has no power on you, because Christ lives. Because Christ rose from the dead. That, that it is very simple. But it is profound. The goal of John is to compel his audience to faith. By his testimony in the power of the Holy Spirit. Who uses the written testimony of the apostles. To regenerate the hearts of men. So, that, so they by the reading or preaching of the apostolic doctrine they might believe the truth that otherwise we suppress an unrighteousness. It is not the truth, the truth lacks anything, but man's heart, their nature, won't believe, won't, be, won't obey. It's the nature of man. It's our nature that governs our desires. And it governs our decisions. It is not that we can't understand the message, but it is that we don't want to understand it. Such it is the contention of the apostle when he says that the wrath of God is kindled against men because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And this is in Romans chapter 1, and in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It is not that truth doesn't get through to us. It doesn't, it's that it doesn't, it's not that God's revelation to men doesn't get through. It's not that men doesn't know there is a God. The problem is that we don't want the Creator. We don't want that God. So unless unless God first changes our nature. Unless God first changes our nature by the preaching of His Word, by the teaching of His Word, by the reading of His Word, the Word of God changes our nature, changes our hearts, so that we may believe, and by believing we may be saved. You see, and this is the intention of John. He says it several times in the Gospel. He wants us, he wants the reader to read and by reading about Jesus, believing and be saved. He says this is his agenda. This is the purpose of his gospel. We, we will read this later in this chapter, in this chapter 20. This is the power of the word of God. So I hope we understand, therefore, what we are reading. We, John is telling us that on the first day of the week, very early, Mary Magdalene and this group of women went to the tomb. They were carrying spices, what tells us probably that they did not know that Joseph and Nicodemus had already put spices in the body of Jesus when they laid him on the tomb. They were going to anoint his body as it was custom. When they get there, they 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 see that uh, they experience an earthquake. Uh, it, Matthew tells us that it appears they're present at this point, and they see the the stone being rolled up by the angel, and the Roman guard that had been placed there because the Jews went to Pilate and said that impostor said that he was going to rise on the third day, and we are afraid that somebody steals his body and his disciples. 
will say that he rose from the dead and the first and the latter deception will be, wor will be worse than the, than the first one. So Pilate tells them to take a guard and, 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 and seal the tomb and, and, and protect it. And in Matthew's account, we are told that when the soldiers saw the angel, which appearance was like a lightning and dazzling clothing, they fell catatonic, I guess. They, they fell like dead men. That's how much of a shock they received. You know, it is very amazing, just in passing through here to finish, you know that God chooses as the first witness of the resurrection, the most unlikely of witnesses. Because in this time in antiquity, women's testimony didn't count. Uh, if it was taken in count, it counted like half of a person. Nobody took the testimony of women in a court of law. And yet these are the testimonies these are the first witness, a group of women that God chooses to be the first ones to go to the, the ones that you know better to tell them that Jesus is risen. And we see John and Peter raised to the tomb, right? He identifies himself as the one who Jesus loved. And it seems that John was younger than Peter because he outruns Peter and he gets there to the tomb first. But he dares not enter. He just stoops down to look into the tomb. And he sees the linen cloth. Laying there with no body. And we said, we read that Peter gets there. And Peter enters into the tomb. And finds the linen clothing on the side. And the, fa the, the cloth that covers the head of Jesus' face. Folded up in place in another part of the, the tomb. What an amazing testimony. But you see, we are told in John that they go back to their homes. But then we would read later that Mary Magdalene lingers and she has an encounter with Jesus again. You know. In Matthew, we read that there he appears to more than 500 people and with him many rose from the dead and were seen by many Matthew dares to say and to put even the soldiers as witnesses of this fact so in conclusion, you know, if you if you will deny the resurrection, you really have to do a lot of work to deny it. It takes a, a lot more faith to deny the account of the Gospels than to say, well, this, this truly happened. And the implications are, what does this has to do with me? Well, I can say I want to draw one direct line between you and this event is this. If you are mortal, if you are a human being, you will face death one day. And here you are being told of one who defeated death. So what you should ask yourself is how can I make myself the beneficiary of the fact that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. That's a direct link for anyone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We praise you this morning. Help us. May your word go out and serve your purpose as you commanded, Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen.